Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the founder of Detox, Pallavi Pandey. How are we doing? We are doing excellent, Gabriel, as best as we can do on a Monday morning. On a Monday, so yes, hello. <laughs> we're, we're over here on a Monday. So first, let's introduce the world to you. Who is Paula V? Give them give a little background introduction. Um, kind of who are you? Thank you for this opportunity. And Paula V is a mom from your from Portland, Oregon. And what she really loves doing is she's on the mission to rescue fallen palm leaves and convert them into something that can be used at least one more time before they actually go to waste, which is in short, Detox Palm Leaf Tableware brand. And why the word detox? Because again, we want people to think of the actual word detox, which is a cleansing journey. And we want to take this cleansing journey beyond the body to the environment. Because to me, what is really important is what's on my plate and what is in my plate. And hence, I started creating my own plates. <laughs> So where are you originally? Are you originally from here in Portland, Oregon? I am not. I lived in Ohio for 10 years. And before that, I actually was born in, and I grew up in India, in the very north part of India. And while growing up, we did used to visit the southern part of India. And as hospitality service, even today, they actually serve food uh, on banana leaves. So that's a very cultural part of my childhood that I grew up with. And that's why... I went back to my roots and I was like, who can do this better than me? Somebody who is still eating on me when I go back, right? So I should be able to very easily get this concept to the Western world and start something here, which I'm not seeing because I really strongly feel this concept of the home palm leaf tableware is not, is not new. It's not just me, again, to be frank, but yes, it is very recent. I started seeing palm leaf tableware a decade ago in the United Kingdom. I started seeing them in Australia. Did I see them in the United States? No, I don't think so. And that's where I found the br bridge. And I was like, I'm going to cross this bridge with these products because I know how to make them. I know where to make them. And I know why I need to make them because I myself was just tired of changing trash piles when I was hosting. I was just done teaching that to my children. And I was like, I think I need to do better parenting. And uh, let's find ways to do this. Yeah, so let's let's explain to the listeners what is detox. What are you trying to do? What what is the business? So detox is a line of uh, compostable, microwave safe, single use disposables, and the beauty is they are made from naturally fallen palm leaves. Like I said, I rescue the fallen palm leaves, which means we don't cut the trees, we don't touch the leaves, we wait for the leaves to just fall on the ground. And we pick them up and then we give them one more use, which is making them into these beautiful, elegant, bamboo style looking with textures, with wooden look, very lightweight. And of course, more affordable and cheaper than bamboo, faster in compostability, like literally two months in the backyard. So these are these single use disposables. And today, um, when, I, when I started them, I created them for people in the households who were done using dishes all the time or wanted to break from doing dishes and have quality time. But then we ended up rippling these products into the food industry, into the hospitality industry, like events and weddings and campings and picnics. And of course, the charcuterie industry. There was such a big change during the COVID years because bamboo is expensive. You have to leave the bamboo boards with your customers. So a lot of our pivot was from the charcuterie board owners, like people who make these amazing cheese boards and jams and jellies. So we saw a big uh, uprise in, in our sales from charcuteries because they were all using our boards instead of the expensive bamboo boards. Nice. Now, so you were rescuing fallen palm leaves. Now, mm -hmm. where you, you're going back home, so I'm assuming this is kind of where this concept got created, right? You're starting to think about like, okay, we're, I'm seeing this done in India. I'm not seeing it done in the United States, but how do you do it? How do you take a palm leaf and turn it into a plate? Thank you for asking that. I, I do get that question a lot of times because people are flabbergasted. They're like, yeah. how? Like, how? <laughs> Tell us how. So it is not a very cumbersome job. No, the only uh, cumbersome part in this whole process is the collecting of the raw material. So what happens is in India, there's a cottage farm industry of palm leaves and they are Areca palm trees in particular, their main purpose is to produce areca nuts. And that those areca nuts are like the beet nuts and they're used in culinary purposes, food products, et cetera, et cetera. Once the nuts are done, the leaves just fall like any other tree. 
and it collects on the floor. And that's where our work starts. So we have a, labor a workforce laborious intensive work where the women workforce that we employ, they, they go and they collect that raw material for us. And then they are cleaned, they are washed with clean water, they are sun dried to give them that dry instead of the green look, the brown look, because they fall in and they sun dry. And once they sun dry, we take, you'll be surprised that the leaf can be up to five foot high. So it's that uh, tall and it can be like five feet wow. even and the, like three feet in the width. So one big leaf can give you a lot of plates or bowls depending on what your shape is, right? So let's say you take the one big leaf and you put it under a hot compressing machine. So there are big hot compressing machines and then you make the molds for the shape you desire. For example, I have a mold that's 10 inch round or if I have a mold that, which is made of uh, steel, uh, it's metal, metal mold. And then it gives the shape to those leaves when you hot compress the big leaf. And that's how you get your tableware. Then each tableware is sanitized under UV rays and it's shrink wrapped and then it's put in the boxes ready to be shipped and sent to the customer. Wow, that's quite the process. Now, yes, you, I mean, are you, how did you, do you like, do you outsource any of this process or are you kind of involved with a lot of it? It's a, it's a combination of both because we do invest in the molds and the people. Uh, apart from the basic payroll, we do provide our employees, which are, again, majority female workforce. And I love to mention it because my goal was to support the women workers in India. And that is why I wanted to manufacture in India. I wanted to get the raw material in India. Some other places where I can get the raw material would be Brazil, Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia. Yes. But again, for me, being my home country, having my representatives, me being able to go there and have that personal connection with somebody else who's making a difference with me was important. And then having them that empowerment, giving them that bread earning title in a male dominating society was my main goal. And that's why I went to India and I sourced my raw material there. And then I asked them to manufacture their, um, the products with me. And then of course we go every year, we meet the team the employees, we try to give them some benefits apart from their payroll. So all of that is, it is a third party manufacturing, but it's just more than a third party. It's become a relationship and a family, a detox family. I love it. Now, when did you start this company? It has been a little over than three years, 2019, right before the pandemic is when we started detox and then we were going up and up and up. And then that's when COVID hit. And that was a heartbreaking time for me because that was the time when we actually saw zero sales and I thought this is the end of my baby because nobody was happy nobody was celebrating nobody was buying right so that's yeah. the last thing people want to do when they're sad and there's so much of havoc around people so uh, that's the time when I actually thought okay this is my third business my venture that I tried what's next <laughs> so that was the thought that came to me uh, in 2020 when the when COVID hit so how so you started this in 2019 and you you scaled it pretty quickly to that you've actually won awards. So first let's talk about some of the awards you won and then two let's talk about how you scaled it. So let's some of the awards name off some of the awards that your team has won. Sure. So I'm sure the listeners might have heard the big expos which are the East Expo and the West Expo and they're the food product uh Expo. So we right in the beginning of our launch we launched in August and in October two months into the business, we snagged the next year awards at the East Expo. That was a huge exposure for us, like a startup getting an award. And yeah. that was our first trade show ever, which was the most expensive trade show. So that was a big deal for us. And right after that COVID hit, but during 2020 was when Shark Tank reached out to us because they were seeing that we were pretty steady with our sales uh, on Amazon. So what happened in 2020 was we also got into so Amazon has two sides of its sales. One is the consumer side, which is a seller central where anybody can go onto their amazon.com account and order whatever they want. The other one is a vendor central, which is more like a B2B side of Amazon where they will buy stuff from you and then they do whatever they want with that. And very early in 2020, we were able to get into both of these channels. So that is very hard for brands to do. Either they are in one or they're in none or with us, we happen to be in both. And I think because of our sales and we were growing so much on Amazon, Shark Tank reached out to us and we auditioned for Shark Tank twice. But of course, we didn't have the numbers. We were just a startup, right? And it's okay to have big dreams. We yeah. had an experience. We learned a lot. 
And I think that gave us a good morale boost about marketing, about social media. Like we, we can do this by ourselves. We are photogenic people. We have a good family. We, we know our story and we know how to say to the world. So I think that was the experience when I started the whole social media uh, for, for detox. Like we were not present on any social media until then. But that's the boost, the confidence I got after auditioning, getting on the TV, getting on the videos, looking at myself. I'm like, okay, I am the influencer. I am the brand voice and nobody can do this better than me it has to be me or my children and my family why because we're in this together we use these at home every day and this is the message that has to come from all of us that's how uh, we started getting exposure and then uh, Portland Oregon is such a small business community community that everybody knows everybody and I think the one most important thing I realized from being an entrepreneur BIPOC women-owned entrepreneur was more than thinking what I know I thought what was important is who I know and that is something I realized very early on in my business. And I started connecting with any organization, any opportunity, any resource, any mentors that I could find. Because, of course, they all knew more than me, right? And I was open. I was curious. And I was ready to learn. And that's how we happened to scale 100 times and double our revenue every year and double our profits. And hence, it's been a wonderful growth because we've been getting so much of small business love from local people, local businesses, everybody knows us. And that's the beauty. When people know you, know your story, know your face, it's a total different ball game versus just using internet, being behind things, that's not gonna convey a message. You know, I, I can't express this enough. And I think this is uh, hopefully a message that's probably trying to ring true now to some of these listeners. Networking is so important. Like nobody knows that you're selling anything if you're not networking and talking about it. And it's not yeah, being and I, or conceited, right? It's just, it's just meat with it. <laughs> yeah, and entrepreneurs, frankly speaking, pitch every day. We try to sell every day. But is yeah. that what we're really doing when we're networking? No, we're building relationships. We are yeah. building our authentic authenticity, our brand, our mission. And that's all in our, in our voice, on our face, on our gestures. And that's what people need to see. That what really motivates us. Why do we do this every day? And, and that's what comes from the heart. Now, so how did you start this business? It sounds like you primarily were focusing on the Amazon channels, the, the B2B and the direct-to-consumer. Now, with that said, what is your experience with it? And is that the like, major majority of where you're spending your time, or do you see a brick and mortar in the future? Uh, so to start with, yes, Amazon was our focus, and it really felt like putting my eggs in one basket. I was too scared because I've, I've heard uh, some notorious... <laughs> cases about blacklisting businesses and then nothing, right? What happens then? So from that time, I was very aware and I was like, I don't want to be in one basket. I want to split my egg. So hence we started improving our website SEO. We started expanding into other online marketplaces like Etsy, like fair.com, walmart.com, wayfair.com. And that's when it took us one year. We were not performing equally in, on all the channels, but with time, with uh, analysis of our products, because I launched like crazy, like 2019, I launched 50 products. Who does that, right? Which which wow. <laughs> business owner launches so much? But I did, and I think I took a step back during COVID because not all my SKUs were fast selling. They were not selling at the same rate, same volumes, and some were just sitting in a warehouse making me lose money. Hence, I took that time during COVID when the sales were, of course, low, um, instead of spending a lot of money on marketing or ads, I just tried to narrow my study on our products and just make them quality products, better products, something where we could see the customer only needs this or that. So analyzing our customer needs, what their feedback was, what their comments was. So that helped us um, strategize our revenue into all these channels. And that's how we've been growing 50% from Amazon and 50% from the website and all other retail channels, but that's not enough because I see there's a huge demand. I still see we can't fulfill what we have. So I do need to pivot into retail, which is, uh, for example, we're in a small farm in Hillsborough, Hillvisha Farms. But again, oh, yeah. do yep. we need to be in Target? We need to be in Whole Foods. We need to be in Trader Joe's. Why? Because we don't want people to plan to place an order two weeks ago or wait for the delivery and the, when, then wait for the delivery to skip the day they really wanted the products on, right? So we want to make the products readily available and easily accessible off the shelf. Like when they're walking, oh, I like this, I want this right now. 
So I think that's my goal. And that's where I want to pivot after three years off e-commerce into retail. I'm not so sure about a standalone retail at the timing. I don't think I'm um, ready for that. But yes, a third party retailing would be an excellent uh, combination for us. So if there are any small business owners that have boutiques, marketplaces and are listening to this, maybe they can try putting our products on shelves and that way they can have uh, customers walking by for traffic, wanting our products. You know, I always use this podcast as like an opportunity to, to teach the listeners, right? And I think you just taught two, two very valuable lessons. One kind of like the premature scaling, right? You went and bought about a bunch of different things and some were sitting. But then what you did was you took a step back. You looked at what your customers were buying and then you started to focus on that, right? Really kind of listening to what your customers wanted versus what do we believe our customers want, right? We, we, as entrepreneurs, we kind of tend to do that, right? We believe we know what our customers want, but then until you actually go back and get that kind of, you know, clarification, right? Or, or, or really kind of justify what you're actually selling, then, then that kind of puts the rubber to the road. Now, how did you finance the business? Did you just kind of go start scaling small, you know, venture capital? Did you go get a finance loan or is this all grassroots effort? It was all bootstrapped. It is still all bootstrapped. And the beauty is that um, this business has given me enough revenue to put it back into the business. I have not yet taken a loan. I have not even asked friends or family. My next goal, if I need to, would be crowdfunding for sure because of all the love and support we see around us. Yep. Of course, that's yep. the best route. But I don't think I'm ready for equity funding yet. But depending, again, on the volumes and if you talk about really B2B, for example, we're getting into Hilton hotels or all the resorts. I mean, that's when I might be open to equity funding or angel investors or venture capitalists. So at the timing, I have been fortunate enough to put in whatever I'm making. So um, that's been helpful. Nice. So I want to talk to you kind of about the start of the business, like how you start in that. But I first really want to, I think this actually might be the first time we've had a guest that has the experience with Shark Tank. What was your experience with Shark Tank? What process did you go to get on the show? And kind of what did you think about it? So I think... Um, it's very, um, it's nothing concrete. I mean, even if they do audition you, there's no guarantee that it will be posted on the TV or you'll get something out of it. So if you have high hopes that it's going to pivot or do some magic into your life, I don't think that's going to happen. But yes, you can, of course, uh, hope for it, that it does. And if it doesn't, it's really you who really needs to pivot this opportunity. Use this as an exposure, brand awareness opportunity. That's what I used it for. And I think that helped us because people knew about a brand. And yeah, all I will say is it's like a marketing tactic. Um, yeah. If you get a shark by your side, great. That's, that's great. I'm not so lucky, you know, because it's your hard work. I'll say, well done. It's your hard work. If you can get a shark by your side too. And even if they do commit, sometimes the, the deal doesn't go through. So it's very haphazard or it's not very concrete to begin with. And I think that's another point you just made. Um, don't believe everything on TV sometimes, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes those deals, even though they're made, in fact, they, I think they actually say it, um, doesn't mean they're finalized deals, right? You still have to go through the negotiation. The lawyers have to get involved. And so that's going <laughs> to kind of get a little tricky. And one more tip to the listeners. I mean, yes, sharks have great powers. They, are, uh, they have great resources. But please leverage the small business resources that are provided to you, please. Because... Sometimes the best outcomes come from the least expected places. So if you have an SB or if you have a mentor, if you have a small business owner, contact them, talk to them, try to get to all the nits and grits of business. And I'm sure you'll get much more help than relying just on the shark. Man, that is very, very true. Now, what would you say has been easy about starting this business? Has oh, been starting a business. <laughs> well, I will say the most important thing was my family support because I come from this is a first generation business. I don't know A or B about business. I'm a BIPOC woman and I'm a woman. So all these combinations are very deadly and I knew nothing about business, but I think I was very lucky or I, I'll just say very, my family was very supportive in what I was doing because they believed in it equally as I did. Why are we doing what we're doing or how we're doing? So whether it is using our own products to hand washing them to drying them, to posting a picture of them. Everybody did every everything. It was just not me running behind the whole business by myself. Like my daughters came up with ideas in the morning. Like I wake up and they're like nine o'clock at the breakfast table. Hey mom, let's do this today. Let's make a reel by we doing this with the product. I'm like, okay. And they are what, eight and 10 now. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's when you see you have a 
family who's thinking just like you, you replicated yourself and that's where the business becomes easy. And it's easy to balance your life and your, your personal life and your business life because everything is going together at the same time. Yeah, so you don't you have know, to segregate this from this or this with that. Yeah. And I think engaging, you know, the way you engage your daughters um, at such a young age, that's very valuable for so many reasons. One, it's teaching them, you know, some business acuity, right? So they're getting some acclimated with some of these things, but two, we're learning from them. I mean, these are our future customers, right? And they're the ones that know the trends on the TikToks and they're watching the reels. Pay attention to what those kids are doing because eventually they're going to be your consumers. So just be mindful of that, you know? Now, what would you say has been difficult about starting this business? Oh, definitely. Like I mentioned, BIPOC women and the first generation in the business world, it just felt very, uh, very alone. Like I was like, uh, no support, no knowledge, no resources or lack of resources, I would, uh, resources is uh, something where I was really scared. And that's why I wake up every morning, but how will I do this? Or how will I find that out? But I think the last two years during pandemic, uh, because the sales were slow, that gave me a good window to do my awareness part for small businesses. What is available? What I can avail? Who can I leverage? Who can I talk to? So I think that gave me a good push to find people online and connect with them and meet them. And uh, that's been a great web of networking that I've done here in Portland. You know, from this interview, what I'm hearing is you have been busting your ass. What motivates you? I mean, you are working right now. <laughs> what continues to motivate you to continue to work so hard? It's definitely not a Red Bull or any pill, but seriously, <laughs> that, that motivation every morning to, this is not enough. I need to do more. Um, and of course, like I said, my children every morning, when they come up with every idea, every day, new idea, I'm like, why can I not? right? They are kids. And this is, if this is mine, this is really, I need to make it mine. And this is my baby. And I really can't stop myself. It's like, I never get um, fatigued out or I never get tired. Like people, when, when they get tired, what do they do? They watch TikTok, they watch Reel, they sometimes do Netflix or they'll have a glass of wine or beer. What do I do? I go to my business, my social media, and I'm posting and I'm making content and I'm doing pictures because that's what keeps me going. And I'm never tired. Not one single morning am I tired. <laughs> so that's my true passion. And I, I love doing what I'm doing. And that's how I keep going. What as a business owner keeps you up at night? Let's go the opposite route. Oh boy, another pandemic perhaps. Um, oh, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> because not only am I, am I worried about the sales, but my whole business structure where I'm manufacturing in India. I mean, if this happens again right now I'm suffering enough like the containers that I used to get for five grand now I have to spend 10 times the money so that keeps on going I don't know how much will I be able to sustain and, and be able to outsource it from India I mean I don't know we'll have to end it we'll have to really I can't cut down on my margins I can't cut down on my prices because I'm anyway spending right now on premium the only thing that would be left with is going down on quality which I really don't want to do because that's what really makes my palm leaf tableware different from our competitors. Like if you lay down five of our competitors, what you will really see with even Shark Tank, a lot of Amazon, a lot of um, world renowned chefs, most of the people have given us that freebie that our quality is premium quality. And I vouch for it because I myself go down to India and we look at a raw material and that's where we decide that which raw material we, we want to go with. You, know, you mentioned, you know, sustaining, right? How do you define sustainability? So I think there are two uh, ways that I define it. Theoretically, uh, because we don't deplete anything from natural resources, we just pick up the renewable resources, which in this case are the fallen palm leaves, and we convert them into something that can be used. That's one way to define sustainability in the true term. Apart from that, um, in a more practical way of being a parent or mompreneur, I say, when I'm able to create a lifestyle where we can live it to the same level uh, is what I call sustainability. And that's why we say we should have habits because they help us keep sustainable lifestyle, a level of way living, a way of living. So I think that's why I define sustainability. It could be, it could be more sustainable, less sustainable, right? It could be, yes, I use plastics, but do I buy more plastics? No, I try to use whatever I have to the most extremity. But will I buy more plastics? Perhaps not unless it's really needed. So again, sustainability, the 
threshold, the extremity of it can be defined in very variable with variables where somebody's in their lifestyle. Do they earn enough to support that lifestyle? Do they earn less? Or it's, it's just so uh, depending on variability. But yes, living a way, living a life in a certain way, sustainability for me. What are, what are some of those routines that you do to kind of keep your business being sustainable? Oh, uh, great question. Uh, for us, it would be definitely using ethical products, uh, no chemicals in the farms. We try to make sure that there are no uh, toxins in the farming of the palm trees, the way they're grown. And we pay fair wages to our employees and we go meet them in person uh, just to build that rapport and relationship. And uh, some of the SDGs we do follow would be no poverty, equal pays for men and women, which is a big deal in India because in old times, men used to get more money than women. And um, that was not liked. Uh, so we, we try to do that, pay them equally. Um, and yeah, a lot of using water as much as you need to clean, not overdoing, and again, not misusing water resources or uh, this, yes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, what would you say, like, would you consider your company a fair trade? I'm, I'm just learning about the fair trade definition. Would you guys consider yourself a fair trade? Yes, we would. And we'll say it's very transparent um, because every dollar that we do get as a profit. So our, what, one of our key mission is also to support the community back in India. Like I said, the majority female workforce, apart from their peer roles, we try to give them extra benefits. That is also a part of our mission is to go back to India by the end of every year and then give them a share of our profits. Nice. So that's, just, yeah. That is really nice. You know, and I think that too just really kind of solidifies like your business of being really back and kind of ingraining yourself into the community. And to your point, what you mentioned in the beginning, going back to your roots and your heritage, right? Kind of back yes. to your, now, what is some advice you would give to some of the listeners? Maybe they're an aspiring entrepreneur. What advice would you give them? Uh, so one thing I do regret in my life is I wish I had started this earlier, way earlier, uh, but no regrets because I am still here doing it. Uh, and I will only say that the first best time to do something is gone. The only thing you can do about it is use this time now because this is the best second time that's come, just fallen in your lap. So, so go do it, whatever it is, because without doing it, you'll never know, right? You'll never find out. You know, I, I said this before, I think on one of the episodes that I think the difference between an entrepreneur and everybody else is the entrepreneur does it, right? Everybody has the idea. Everybody has the idea. It's the difference is taking that idea and putting some practicality behind it and trying to make a business out of it. Right? And you have to be a risk taker. You have to be a trailblazer because you don't know what path you're walking on. But if you believe in it, it's not far from reach. Have you ever had a moment of self-doubt? Oh, yes. A lot of times. I mean, sometimes, yeah, I'm a mom, right? Moms go through self-doubts every day in personal life. So <laughs> business is no different from a personal life. Like I said, for me, it's all together, one and the same thing. So there has been times. Uh, but again, putting yourself in the basket with other small business owners, seeing their failures or their achievement, that's where you can really measure. Why am I doubting myself? This is good. Or I've done good. Or this is okay, this is where I need to go. So that helps you make yourself aware to what your goals should be and how you should get them. Yeah, you know, I, I talked uh, before about imposter syndrome, kind of how that self-doubt creeps in. Everybody had to start at the starting line at one point in life, right? Uh, nobody knows everything, but I think one thing that you pointed out is getting out and networking with individuals that have experience, that have the knowledge that maybe you do not have. Because in truth, you probably have experience and knowledge that the individuals that you're learning from that are learning from you, right? It's, it's kind of a shared, you know, I talk about this often, we're a global of, of uh, entrepreneurs, you know, and so having this global opportunity to meet with individuals, I'm meeting with you and you're from India. I mean, I'm learning a lot from this episode. And so having that opportunity to network with folks, so important, I can't even begin to tell you guys, uh, folks that listening, it just really truly is important. Now for those folks at home, how do they get in contact with you? Where's your business, email, social media, let them know how they can get in contact with you and buy some of your, some of your wear. Sure, so we do sell nationwide in the United States. We do provide free shipping anywhere in the 50 states. So people can go to our website, which is www.detox.com. And here the spelling of the word detox is different because we want to make the word with a twist. People to think 
And this spelling is D-T-O-C-S, but it's inspired from the actual word detox again, right? So the website is a way to get in touch and see all our inventory. Another few ways would be if you're a big supporter of Etsy or Wayfair.com, Walmart.com, Fair.com, or Amazon, you can find us there. And uh, like I said, if people like to reach out to me directly, I love answering people questions, sending them samples. So if there's anything that I can make you to fall in love with our products, to make you feel experience our products so that you can touch them, you can feel them, you can try them yourself because you can microwave them, you can compose them in two months in the backyard. Whatever it is that you need to make yourself fall in love with the products, do reach out to me directly. And I'm sure we can post my LinkedIn profile where people can check out my profile or get in touch on social media with us where I personally take the opportunity to uh, talk to in each individual person who sends a message. I love it. And again, folks, go ahead and check it out. That's D-T-O-C-S dot com. Paul, thank you so much. This was an awesome conversation. Very, very interesting things. And folks at home, I hope you guys are listening and, and, and take her up on the option. Information will also be available on the Shades of E newsletter. If you're not subscribing, please visit the Shades of E dot com. Without that, please follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the Shades of E and have a great night.